Thanks very much. Um, so I'm going to talk about something which um, isn't close to Peter's heart because at least when I knew Peter better, he was a lifelong teetotaler. Although I, although I remember having discussions with him about whether the evidence that moderate alcohol protected about, against coronary heart disease should make him do a sort of sing the trial of himself with a sort of small glass of uh, something every evening. But I don't know whether that uh, that, that ever happened. But uh, so uh, the story of alcohol and uh, coronary heart disease partly started in the unit uh, that Peter became director of when uh, Archie Cochran, who uh, liked to do things to amuse and annoy, as he often said, uh, started doing correlations of uh, lots of factors against each other uh, related to health. And famously, uh, with the anomaly that wouldn't go away, they showed that the more doctors there were for, for, uh, for the population, for population's unit, uh, the worse the infant mortality rate was after taking uh, gross domestic product into account. And as they said, they said that we believe that papers and letters should amuse as well as instruct, therefore we show you this graph. So, but as I said, I think, I think annoying uh, was also a part of uh, what Archie liked doing. And the next uh, analysis uh, they did uh, uh, to amuse uh, as well as instruct was of uh, alcohol, in particular of wine, where they demonstrated a strong inverse correlation between population wine consumption uh, and coronary heart uh, and coronary heart disease. Uh, and they said that you know the next step would be to see whether wine uh, uh, had positive effects on plasma on blood lipids, by which they meant HDL cholesterol and, and platelet aggregation. And if then the mechanisms were shown to be plausible, uh, that there should be a randomized trial perhaps uh, of alcohol consumption. They did, however, however, say that they didn't want people to identify the component of wine that you could extract from it uh, because they, they was, it was served perfectly well uh, in, the, in, the, in the bottles you had. And the whole series of studies uh, uh, then followed. I mean, there'd been a couple of um, observational studies before that, prospective studies, and then a whole series of studies followed. Uh, Michael Marmot, who's here, did uh, one on the U-shaped curve with uh, Martin Shipley, Jeffrey Rose. Uh, this is a well-known one from the Lance Search from the Physicians uh, Health Study. Uh, I like this one because the, uh, the lowest risk of coronary heart disease it was, uh, was the, the, uh, the top category, which was uh, more, more than three pints of beer, of the, of the strength that beer was in the US in 1990. So more, <laughs> more than three pints a day was the optimal amount. That's, 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 that's something to live for. And uh, the author of that study uh, considered that this was causal and thought that uh, uh, lack of not drinking should be considered a common heart disease risk factor and thought that HDL cholesterol, which was then believed to be uh, protective uh, against uh, coronary heart disease, was uh, mediated 50% of that and fibrinogen mediated a big chunk of the rest. That was the, that was the mediation claims. And of course, when these, these studies continue to appear, this is one from about four years ago, uh, which used a, a vast record linkage. It showed that for 12 cardiovascular diseases, moderate alcohol consumption appeared to lower the risk uh, of them. And for coronary heart disease, like the RIM study, even heavy alcohol consumption appeared to be beneficial. And when these studies appear, the newspapers love them. You know, you start at the top of the market, this is the Guardian, Actually, pre-pandemic, I used to say the Guardian was top of the market, but it's pandemic coverage, I was not so impressed by. But anyway, uh, top of the market, uh, uh, at least for some. The independent, a bit down market, drinking a pint of beer a day, linked to reduced risk of heart attacks, going really down market. The Daily Mail, cheers, <laughs> drink one glass of wine a night, does it for you. And then the right at the bottom, you know, the Daily Star, uh, alcohol slashes risk of heart problems. Uh, as you might expect from Time magazine, the more sober alcohol is good for your heart most of the time. And from the Irish Times, moderate drinking make up risk of heart disease. That's a reasonable report, but I especially like moderate drinking may be good for your heart, and even heavy drinking may lower your risk of heart attack, <laughs> a new study indicates. Now, uh, observational studies obviously have the problems of reverse causation. If you go to the doctor, whatever's wrong with you, they tend to drink less. Uh, and there's many uh, uh, social factors are actually related to more steady drinking during the week, better social, higher social uh, position. 
um, so there's this reverse cause or this uh, illness leads people stopping drinking uh, and uh, socioeconomic and other confounding factors. So uh, a method, one method which can help here is to use genetic variants, which are proxies for the modifiable exposure, a method that's become known as Mendelian uh, randomization. And alcohol is one of the exposures which can be studied in this way, because in East Asian uh, populations, there is a common, commonly carried variant, which is essentially a null variant in acetaldehyde dehydrogenase gene, which clears acetaldehyde, which is, uh, which is metabolized from alcohol. And so in cartoon form, uh, uh, acetaldehyde gives you all the unpleasant uh, features of drinking alcohol, palpitations, headache, flushing, guilt, actually not guilt, but it does give you, it does give you, it does give you the other unpleasant effects. And uh, in these populations, uh, for, um, men who, who, who drink, uh, uh, on, in general, the, the men drink, but uh, the, what, the men who are homozygous for this null variant uh, hardly drink anything at all. Uh, whereas the men who are heterozygous uh, drink uh, on average a certain, a certain amount, <coughs> and the men who are uh, homozygous for the wild type, i.e. they can clear their acetaldehyde perfectly well, uh, uh, um, drink the most. But also, uh, conveniently, for epidemiology, in these populations, women drink very little, or, or at the time these studies were done, drank very little. So if the gene is having an effect, the genetic variant is having an effect which is not through alcohol, you would see that among, among, amongst women as well as men. If the effect is through alcohol, you will only see the effect amongst <coughs> men. So uh, this is these are data. There's now massive more massive more, more data, but this is meta-analysis we did demonstrating the stepwise uh, increase in alcohol consumption by a wild type genotype for men, uh, and the fact that women don't drink at all. And in this meta-analysis, the homozygous wild the homozygous knockout men had seven millimeters of mercury lower blood pressure than the uh, homozygous wild type. This is by far the largest common genetic variant effect on blood pressure, by far the largest, and it is entirely mediated by the environment. So there's a sort of genes equals environment aspect here that much, many genetic variants will influence things through uh, environmental factors. Uh, and in the women, you see, you notice that there's no impact on, on blood pressure, <coughs> and the women, don't, there's no impact of the genotype on, uh, uh, on drinking. And this, this has been replicated now many, many times. This is a study we did in, uh, with Korean data where you see the substantial difference in blood pressure. GD is the wild type uh, homozygotes who drink uh, most. AA drink virtually nothing. And you see large effects on HDL cholesterol. And Peter's unit did a randomized control trial, did one of the first randomized control trials showing that alcohol does indeed increase HDL cholesterol to a substantial amount. There's a weak negative effect on LDL uh, uh, cholesterol, uh, which isn't seen in all studies, uh, but the positive effect on high blood glucose and higher triglycerides is seen in all the studies. So the risk factor associations have been uh, replicated. And in the study set up by Zeng Ming Chen and Richard Pito uh, and others in China, the China Kadori Biobank, uh, Iona Millwood uh, analyzed the data both observationally and in an adapted form of this Mendelian randomization analysis, when both sex and uh, area within China, the sort of recruitment area where there's large differences in average alcohol content, we used a stratifying variant so you could get a dose response effect. And at the top, you see these U shaped curves for both ischemic stroke and uh, hemorrhagic stroke and temporal stroke, but the predicted causal effects are linearly, uh, are linearly um, upwards. For myocardial infarction and uh, coronary heart disease, again, there's markedly U shaped effects of almost halving the risk of the never drinkers <coughs> in the moderate drinkers. But the genetic epidemiological analyses are flattish. But here, there is uh, the, the um, level of precision uh, is, is not great. So more, more research is necessary. When I was in Scotland, and this is one of the beers I used to like, I'll never be able to sue that company for because they call the beer old mortality. So I can't say that I didn't know what I was doing because I was getting through my three night, three night, prior to live long. So let's, so to go back to those two quotes, 
Uh, I think it is not the case that evidence indicates association between monetary alcohol consumption and high risk of CHD is causal. Uh, I think uh, that, that, that we have substantial evidence against that. This is true, but not true in the way the authors wanted it to be true, because Mendini randomization shows that HDL cholesterol has absolutely no effect on coronary heart disease, as does a massive number of randomized controlled trials raising HDL cholesterol by very different mechanisms. So it is true that half of the beneficial effect of moderate alcohol intake is due to increased HDL cholesterol concentrations because half of nothing is nothing and the fact that indeed HDL cholesterol has no effect on coronary heart disease. So, that, so one of the issues is that the mediators that, the, that was believed to be important, both HDL cholesterol and fibrinogen, uh, are not now, do not now have substantial evidence of, uh, with respect to causality and of being targets for interventions. Uh, as uh, Archie et al. concluded that there would be ethical problems of doing a large a randomized trial of alcohol intake, and this was demonstrated starkly by the NIH having to remove the funding from a large scale study. It is tragic, this is a real tragic case. There was a, a randomized trial was going to be done of alcohol intake and health outcomes. And the uh, investigators, the academic investigators were in cahoots with the alcohol industry. And because of that 140 page report by Francis Collins, really worth reading. This is one of the most shocking documents that I know of in relation to medical research, uh, showed the unethical uh, activity of the investigators with respect to being influenced by alcohol company. Really worth reading. Uh, so provisional conclusions is for overall cardiovascular disease mortality, alcohol is a monotonic adverse effect. For coronary heart disease, more evidence is required, but there's not a substantial beneficial effect. Coronary heart disease might, may not be a homogeneous category with respect to alcohol effects in different uh, countries, different contexts. There may be a, the, uh, that category, category may be made up of different components, one of which may have be benefited. There may be beneficial effects, but more research needed. Alcohol adds to the conundrum regarding divergent ischemic stroke and CHD risk factors. You know, we know so many risk factors that are the same for ischemic stroke and uh, um, and coronary heart disease, but of course the, well, the descriptive epidemiology uh, is so different. Um, there's much to be learned from that. The apparent mediators are not mediators because they don't, do not have causal effects. More research is needed, and more research is needed on the thing that Archie mentioned in his paper, platelet aggregation. And Peter, here we see, has been, has been uh, investigating the causal effects of platelet aggregation using Mendelian randomization. So the next, the next thing that needs to be done is just to use Mendelian randomization to say, does alcohol affect platelet aggregation? Because the one remaining potential mechanism uh, for which alcohol may have a small beneficial effect uh, would be through uh, platelet aggregation. So that's Peter's next, uh, if that's his next study that he must do. And I'd like to thank uh, the people who did the work that I showed. And I'd also uh, like to thank Peter uh, I don't think Peter knows this, but the reason I am in, I'm now, I'm, I'm in epidemiology is actually due to him. He, uh, I had a short term job in Cardiff uh, and I was becoming unemployed and indeed I did become unemployed briefly, but Peter had put a grant in for me to study lead <coughs> and I decided that that grant wasn't funded. I was going to go and do a PhD in neuropsychology in Montreal, but the grant was funded. So epidemiology's loss was neuropsychology's gain. <laughs> That's a great way to start the afternoon. Uh, questions for George? <clears throat> Peter? The main worry we had in that J shape, you call it a U shape, I think it's not even as sure, yeah. J. Uh, the worry we had was, do, is the distinction adequate made adequately between heavy drinkers who for one reason or another have given up and therefore in the survey is mm. counted as a non-drinker abstainer there certainly is a shift yeah we have assumed that men on their past history of alcohol and we find a shift but is that adequately accounted for to allow that to be... So, 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 so the lovely thing about the Mendelian randomization in East Asia is that none, none of these people who are null variant homozygous have, have, have drunk a large amount ever in their lives. You know that. 
There's one case <coughs> of a homozygous null variant of man who um, drank, uh, drank a reasonable amount. And it turned out that he woke up in the morning and opened the can of beer and he had a tiny sip. And then five minutes later, he had another absolutely tiny sip. And by doing this, managed to sort of titrate it. And I adore beer, but even I wouldn't be, <laughs> wouldn't, have the, wouldn't have the will to sort of uh, to, to live that way. So, so that group, that, that group won't contain any ex heavy drinkers, uh, which is why I think you know you get the you know they're, they're the lowest risk. I, I think that the, I think reverse causation is is reverse causation from early stages of disease, whether it's like biological reverse causation with atheroma influencing C-reactive protein and other inflammatory cytokines, or if it's um, like social, if you like, um, reverse causation, your doctor tells you not to drink when you're, and you obey them. Uh, I think reverse causation is the most difficult um, form of confounding to deal with. It's like confounding by indication in, in observational studies of treatments. Uh, and that's why I think methods like Mendelian randomization, using negative controls, and these other uh, ways of strengthening causal inference uh, are really a uh, step forward for epidemiology. Well, at 92, almost 92, can I put myself forward as a proof? Absence, <laughs> 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 total absence. <laughs> you can't be associated with uh, living far too long. I think in, in my case, it's total abstinence starts tomorrow. <laughs> <laughs>